recording now. All right. And hello, I'm Dr. Lexi Silence with Elements of Wellness. I'm glad mm -hmm. you can join me here today to go over um, the three labs to reclaim your health. And today we're going to talk about, as I discussed earlier, the CBC or the complete blood count with differential. The with differential is an important piece, your lipid panel and your thyroid panel. So, and let me know at any point if you have trouble seeing anything, hopefully you can see my screen right now. And um, so what I like to do is review labs and why do I like to review labs? Well, to me, labs are a great way to bridge more analytic scientific with more holistic and natural um, methods. Looking at our blood work is an easy way to really understand what the body is doing. Um, blood work provides you the most reliable, repeatable, and affordable way to measure what's happening within the body. By looking at labs, we're able to look at root cause that's going on, and then we can treat you, the person. And for my own practice, I like to treat whole body. So body, mind, and spirit. And let's see. Okay. So my ultimate goal for you today is that you're going to come away with knowledge about how to read your own labs. If you have the knowledge to read them, you're going to be empowered to take those changes and steps that you need to improve your health. Those labs provide the keys to change and then therefore you'll have increased health and a better life overall. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so why are you here? Are you struggling with any health conditions currently? I just want you to think about why you're here. Do you know anybody else in your family, in your friends that are maybe struggling with autoimmune conditions, chronic diseases? pain, headaches, whatever it may be. And then I want you to think about if you've gone to the doctors and they've told you that maybe your labs are normal, but you still feel like crap, or perhaps you look at your labs and your doctor said it was normal, but there are things that are out of range in those labs. So why would your doctor tell you they're normal when clearly there's things that are outside of the range of normal? And what I like to do is look at your labs from what's considered a functional standpoint. So when you go have your labs done and you're looking at maybe it's lab core or quest, you're going to see normative ranges there. And those normative ranges are lab specific, but they're also based on other people that are going into the labs. So you're being compared to somebody who's sick. And as this world gets sicker and sicker, those ranges of what's considered normal have grown. So with functional lab analysis, we're narrowing down that range. We're taking it back to where it was 20 or 30 years ago and comparing you to a healthy population versus a sick population. By doing this, we're able to uncover better um, underlying issues before they manifest into full-blown pathological states. And it's also easier to treat. So I like to say that Western medicine or your doctors are looking at states of disease or pathology, whereas functional lab analysis is looking at states of health or unwellness, unwellness and unhealthy, whatever it may be. So that's what we're looking at. So two totally different things, but we're able to better find those causes and, and, and treat them sooner for you so that you can get back to feeling better. I am using a new program today. So it's like the markers keep disappearing. So, so I apologize for going back on those screens. Um, so what can change for you if you understand how to read your labs? Maybe you'll have better energy, less aches and pain, 
easier pregnancy or getting pregnant, um, less fatigue, less medications, better stages of your life like menopause and different hormonal changes will be less bothersome to you. All of these are things that we can uncover and remediate by looking at labs. So the first lab we're gonna look at is the CBC with differential. In my opinion, this is the most important lab to have. So if you have only one lab, this is the one that you need. The CBC will tell us whether or not you have underlying infections in your body, what your iron status is, or if we need to do a deeper dive into your irons and the different types of infections that you may have. Generally, when we look at illnesses, illnesses manifest from infections, stress, and toxins. So this will give us a really good starting point as far as what may be underlying any of your health issues. So CBC with differential. And if you have the CBC with differential, just put a note in the chat, let me know that you have it. And again, for anyone who's joined, feel free to just hop on there and, and say hello. You're welcome to have any questions in the chat or raise your hand um, every so often. I'll take a look and see who's doing that. But if you have a CBC with differential, let me know. Awesome. Wendy, glad to hear that. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So the CBC with differential, you're going to see a couple of different markers um, on your page. And the top one should say WBC. And that stands for your white blood cell count. The functional range that we want to see these is between five to eight. If you're your own specific results fall outside of five to eight, then that tells us there's an infection in your body. Okay. The next one would be your RBC, and then you can scroll down through to the MCVC. And these are markers for iron status. And I'll go into those in another lab, but generally, if they're very low, you need a full iron panel. If they're high outside of um, the normal range that's listed there, you may have trouble absorbing your B vitamins. The next one, if we scroll down a little bit farther, will be your neutrophils, then your lymphocytes, your monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. And these are markers of infection in the body. So we're gonna go a little bit deeper into those. So neutrophils are the first one, and these signal a bacterial infection. So for normal neutrophils, we want to see your numbers below 60%. Okay, if it's higher than 60%, that lets us know that you have a bacterial infection in the body. Does anyone have any questions on that? And if anybody has anything that's off, just let me know. Okay, so again, neutrophils are bacterial. Lymphocytes are viral. And so we want to see your lymphocyte numbers below 35% or less than 35%. If they start going above 35%, then you have a viral component to whatever the infection possibly is in your body. Now, is it possible to have both a bacterial and a viral component? Absolutely. So an autoimmune condition, you're going to have sort of a one-to-one -one ratio, which would mean that perhaps your neutrophils would be around 46%. Maybe your lymphocytes would be around 48%. So instead of a two-to-one ratio, that's 60% to maybe 30%, if you have a one-to-one -one ratio, again, like 46 to 48, 
then you're struggling with an autoimmune condition. And so autoimmune doesn't need to be scary, but what that means is that your body is fighting both a bacterial and a viral with a viral stronger component at that time. So because your body is fighting a higher load of the viral, it doesn't produce enough of the T cells to help fight the bacterial infection. Okay. So if you look again at your neutrophils and your lymphocytes, if you see a one-to-one -one ratio between those two numbers or pretty close to it, you have an autoimmune issue. If one is high, but the other one is not, then you're struggling with either a viral or a bacterial load. Now, monocytes are another viral indicator. And from monocytes, that's where we get mono. Okay, so this is a good indicator of an active Epstein-Barr virus. Generally, we want to see our monocytes below 7%. When you start getting above 10%, you would likely test positive for Epstein-Barr if, if your doctor tested you for that. So monocytes are a great indicator of viral. If your monocytes are high, your lymphocytes may not be high. It doesn't mean that you don't have a viral infection. You could have both of those be a little bit high. Uh, but again, if it's above 7%, you're struggling with some sort of viral load. If it starts to get above 10, 11%, then likely you would test positive for Epstein-Barr. Any questions so far? If so, type them in the notes or unmute yourself and we can chat about it. Um. I have um, normal numbers for everything but the neutrophils, and my neutrophil is 57%. Is that a concerning, like what would that, what kind of um, uh, bacteria is it measuring? So it doesn't really matter what it's measuring because how we treat it is the same. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's just telling us there's bacterial can we delve in deeper with other labs to find out what exactly that bacteria is? Yeah, we could, um, but treatment's gonna be the same regardless. So it doesn't like, really matter. Uh-huh, so is it, could it be like SIBO or something like that? that is it, being... it could be, absolutely uh -huh. it could be. So one thing that these lab markers do not tell us is if there's a fungal component but generally, if you have any sort of viral or bacterial, there's usually an underlying fungal component going on. Okay. Just because everything's thrown out. So we always treat fungal, um, especially with bacterial. Now, a good way to know if you have SIBO is yes, if your bacteria markers are high, but perhaps you've also tried probiotics. And if you try probiotics and you feel like your bloating and gas gets worse with probiotics, then that's a good indicator that you maybe have SIBO or SIFO. Did and that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, but what is the bacteria marker? Is there something other than the neutrophils? Nope, just the neutrophils. Okay. All right. Okay, all right. So the next one that we're looking at is eosinophils, and we want these to be below 3%. Eosinophils are a great indicator of food sensitivities and or parasites. Usually I'm going to assume food sensitivity unless you've tried diet elimination um, and really been living fairly clean. If you've already done an elimination diet or maybe a FODMAP, something like that, and your gut is still really not where you want it to be, and these markers are still high, then I'm going to consider parasites. It is normal for us to have some parasite load in our body and viral and bacterial at all times. The problem is, is when they get out of control, that's when we need to take care of them. So if you see this number for eosinophils at above 3%. Again, we want to make sure your diet's been on point. And if not, then we're going to look at parasites. Any questions on that? Um, I actually was noticing on 
the lab report that I'm looking at, that there is both neutrophils and neutrophils absolute. Okay. So, and they're different. Yep. So the absolute doesn't matter. Okay. You want the one that's going to be the percentage. Um, okay. Yeah. The absolute generally is a marker that we use as far as figuring out um, the, um, for European, because they measure things differently. So don't worry about that. Okay. Just the percentage. Yes. So this is not absolute. This should just be, I mean, so when you're looking at those markers, it's just going to be the percentage. Um, generally, they're, they're going to include both absolute and the percentage numbers. Barb, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I was wondering, uh, mine's, I'm not even sure these are percents. It, it just says 0. 0.2. Okay. It, so they're giving that... you, yeah, that's the absolute. Um, oh, okay. We'll connect um, after afterwards and I'll take a look and see what's going on there. Um, some labs, where's, what lab did you get these done at? That was LabCorp. Okay. Usually LabCorp will include the percentage. It might be on a different page. Oh, okay. Um, I, I know it can be a little screwy to see that. Let me give me just a second here. And... Yeah, so it'll either be absolute or percentages. And we can't um, change it, I mean, figure it out. No, there that. is a okay. formula to fill out. So I'll track down oh, that formula. Um, that you can change it to. Usually it's dividing one by another. So I'll get that formula for you and then we oh, can thank you. You'll be able to convert that. Okay. Okay. Great question. Thank you. And then the next and last one is basophils. This is very similar to the eosinophils. We want it below 3%, ideally below 1%. Again, it's a good indicator of food sensitivities or parasites. I have never seen the basophil numbers above 2%, um, but if yours is higher than that, then I would definitely consider parasites. Okay. So again, these markers let us know whether or not you have an infection in the body. Now your white blood cell count can be normal, can be within that five to eight range, although maybe some of your other markers are higher and that's okay. But you can also have a white blood cell count that's low or high, and then markers of infection as well. Now your doctor may not look at those. A lot of times they may not even order this lab, but I think it's the most important because again, it's the underlying issue that will lead to all the other things that we're going to discuss. Any other questions as far as the CBC with differential? All right. Oh, uh, so, Lexi, actually, there was one question. You mentioned the red blood cells in the MCVC uh -huh. having to do with iron status, but you didn't yeah. say what the ideal range is. So the ideal ranges on those are, they're kind of all over the board. So the RBC, we want it to be between 3.9 and 4.5 if you're a female and 4.4 and 4.9 if you're a male. Uh -huh. So if it's higher than that, then that tells me that there's maybe a methylation problem that your body is not converting the B vitamins appropriately, which is going to impact how iron and oxygen are transported through the body. Okay. If it's lower than that, then that tells me that, oh, we probably need to request a full iron panel, okay? Um, HBG stands for your hemoglobin levels. And this one is 3.5 to 14.5. And again, 
same thing as the RBC. If it's high, that's going to be a B vitamin issue or methylation problem. If it's low, we want to consider running a full iron panel. And then the next one below that would be HCT, which is your hemocrit level. And that we want between 37% and 44% for a female and 39% and 55% for a male. Can you start the female range again? 37 to 44. Thank you. Okay. And again, just like the other markers, if it's high, it's a B, B vitamin methylation problem. If it's low, we need to consider iron panel. The more of these markers that you have that are off one way or the other, the more it reinforces that that is an issue that we need to look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your MCV uh, is between 85 and 92. No difference for male or female. And then MCH is between 27.7 and 32. And then your MCHC is between 32 and 36. Now it is possible to have some of those be high and some be low, um, especially if your body has been fighting a chronic infection for a long time. Both of those may be, you might see numbers all over the place. So some might be really low, some might be really high. And your body will use up more oxygen and more nutrients when it's fighting an infection. So that's why oftentimes you need to give the body more when you're sick so that it has surplus to use to fight the infections. Is anyone noticing any iron markers that are off? <clears throat> for for the three that you just mentioned the mcv mch uh -huh. and so forth um if your number is pretty much at the upper limit is that an indication that something might be kind of close to going out of control or you know i would just monitor it and that's mm -hmm. why again i like to look at more than one blood test. So if you have those from years previous, you can kind of see what, where it's tracking. Mm -hmm. um, if it's just a one time off, then you may have been struggling with an acute in effect infection when you had the blood test done, and then that may have normalized. But if you see this routinely, if you look back on previous labs, then that may be something that we need to take a deeper look at. Um, okay. What I like to do is there are some supplements that can help, especially with methylation. Um, one that I really like is Moore's, and that really helps to, to increase the uptake of the B vitamins in the body. Um, there's also ones that can lower homocysteine. And when ho homocysteine is like a, a toxic byproduct of using vitamins and minerals, when that gets too high, that impacts the uptake of the B vitamins and the oxygenation in the cells as well. If your iron markers are low, again, I do recommend asking your doctor for an iron panel. Some of them have fought me against that. I don't know why, um, but if, you, if your iron levels are off, you're not gonna feel good. You're gonna be very fatigued and it's gonna be hard for your body to get to that next level of healing. So it really is quite important to make sure your iron markers are good. Um, if you eat meat, red meat is the best thing you can do to improve your iron markers. If your iron markers are very low, you may need um, prescription iron medications. Do not go supplementing on your own though. Iron is not something you wanna supplement on your own. Make sure you see a doctor as far as supplement any, any iron. Any other questions? Okay, so we're gonna look at a case study here. 
So I have a client whose uh, white blood cell count was at nine. Her neutrophil count was at 68. Lymphocytes were at 32. Monocytes are one. Eosinophils are one. Basophils are one. The only symptom she complained of was chronic pain, especially in her shoulders. And oftentimes you'll find that bacterial infections can migrate to different joints or different muscle tissues in the body. And by taking care of that bacterial infection, suddenly the pain goes away. So if you know anyone that's in chronic pain, absolutely have them take a look at their lab work. If those neutrophil markers are high, I bet you that's one of the biggest culprits to that pain. So with this lady, she was 36. Again, she was struggling with shoulder pain and some lower back pain. Um, we took care of the bacterial infection and then suddenly she had no more pain. Wow. So pretty simple. Everything else was normal on her labs. The white blood cell count just reinforced that there was a neutrophil number that was a little bit higher than we would like to see it. Okay. And another example is we have a white blood cell count at three. This was Jerry. He was, God, how old? Jerry was about 48. His neutrophil levels were at 46. Lymphocytes were at 48. Monocytes were at five. Eosinophils at 0.1 and basophils at 0.1. So the, now the neutrophil number is that one-to-one -one ratio again. So it doesn't matter if it's a three-to-one ratio, four-to-one ratio. What we're concerned with is when it's a one-to-one -one ratio. And again, that will tell us it is a autoimmune condition that's going on with the viral component. So you can see the lymphocyte number is higher, which is why it's a viral component. We also have a high monocyte number it's still within the normal range, but it's getting a little bit elevated. So this just reinforces that there is an autoimmune condition with a viral component. And so with this, I treat both the bacterial and the viral component. Um, people that I see this in, they tend to maybe have thyroid problems, um, lupus, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, you know, anything that you may have that's a, an autoimmune condition you'll see that here. And these autoimmune conditions are much more disruptive to the whole body symptoms. And we're gonna go into that with some of the other labs. Is anybody seeing any sort of patterns with their own labs now? And don't be shy, hop in there. I want you to learn from this. So feel free to ask questions. Um, I, I definitely see um, a methylation pattern, which makes sense, given what I already know. Mm -hmm. And um, that uh, bacteria. Okay. And that kind of corresponds with my personal chronic pain experience. Yep. Yep. So, so definitely something that is treatable. If, now, if you were to take these lab results to your doctor, they're going to laugh at you because they don't read labs this way. Um, again, they're looking at it from states of disease, not states of wellness. So for them, they're within what's quote the normal range because they're not really trained to read labs functionally. Okay. So as much as we would all love to just run to the doctors, they're going to laugh at you if you go to them with this. Okay, so now is the lipid panel. And I think a lot of people are scared to have their lipids um, read or the doctor to look at their lipid panel because they're fearful that the doctor's gonna tell them their cholesterol is high and put them on statins. Have any of you been recommended to be on statins at all? I'm working on getting off of a statin. I mean, I'm already off of it and taking niacin treatment right now. So good. We'll good. see. Yeah. Got fantastic. Niacin is way better than statins with no side effects other than the flushing. So fantastic. So statins are one of the most commonly prescribed drugs out there. 
but they don't have to be there. It's a problem. <laughs> um, most adults that I know are on statins at some point. Supposedly, statins are supposed to decrease cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. But, and I don't know if you've paid any attention to this, since the 80s, when they really started pushing statins, the rates of cardiovascular disease have increased, the rates of strokes have increased, and heart attacks have increased. There is not any definitive study that actually shows that cholesterol um, is negatively, negatively impacts any of these things. Usually it's the other things that are going along with the body that will create the cardiovascular and the stroke issues. Cholesterol is extremely important for our body and especially our brain. And we'll go into that just a little bit more. Now, there are a lot of side effects with statins. And let's see here. Okay, so your brain is made up of 30% of cholesterol. So if you're trying to reduce your cholesterol levels and you're taking statins and it's taking those levels all the way down, you may start to notice more degenerative diseases. You may notice more brain fog, headaches, all sorts of things. And that's because your brain needs cholesterol. So cholesterol is crucial to our cellular function. Cholesterol um, helps to make up the healthy fats around each of our cells and hormone production. So if you're on struggling with hormones and maybe the doctor tells you you need bioidentical hormones, maybe you need to be on thyroid meds, that could be because your cholesterol level is too low. So low cholesterol can lead to weakness, fatigue, memory loss, degenerative diseases, lowered immunity, reduced mitochondrial function, you name it, everything can be related back to low cholesterol. Okay. So side effects of low cholesterol, would it be high, high blood sugar, headaches, muscle weakness, dizziness, thinning hair, gas, bloating, memory loss, neuropathy, drowsiness, nausea, vomiting, tingling. Now, I don't know about you, but I would prefer not to be on statins and have all of these other side effects for a possible 1% improvement in you know, overall health that the statins can provide. So um, I think it was you, Barb, that had mentioned the niacin. Niacin is a very safe and effective way to balance out cholesterol levels. Um, and it's a very needed B vitamin. So absolutely one of the best things you can do for that. Okay. Now your lipid profile, you want your total cholesterol to be generally between one, 180 and 200. And the, the total cholesterol is at the bottom here. And then your triglycerides, this is where you want to look at, you, you may have heard of looking at ratios for your cholesterol. And this is what we want to look at. Your triglycerides should be about half of what your cholesterol level is. So if your cholesterol level is at 200, you want your triglycerides to say be at 100. That would be half. And then your HDL we want to be half of your triglycerides. So if your triglycerides were 100, we want your HDL to be at 50. Now, if your total cholesterol is at 220, I'm not too worried about that. If it starts to get up to 250, then I start to get a little bit more concerned, but say your cholesterol is at 250, but now your triglycerides are at 180, okay? definitely not a, um, a half ratio there. And then is your HDL at 60? Well, that's not half of 180. So we see it's all sort of scattywampus um, for lack of better term. So when your cholesterol panel is all off and wonky like that, we're probably looking at an autoimmune condition or blood sugar regulation problems. 
And a good way to know, and we're going to go into this a little bit deeper. Let me switch over here. So again, you want your total cholesterol to be about 180 to 200. And then your L, your triglycerides, excuse me, should be half of your total cholesterol. And then your HDL should be half of your triglycerides. LDL, we want to still see quite a bit lower, usually 60 and below is what I prefer. Okay. So again, the ratio is most important. It's half, half, and half. Okay. So let's say, for example, your um, cholesterol is pretty high at 250. And then let's say your triglycerides are also high, like we said in the other example at 180. And then your HDL is low. So maybe now your HDL is at 30 or 40. This is a good indicator of insulin resistance. And when your body is insulin resistant, that means that the cell levels are being damaged. Um, and so it's really something that we need to fix. So not only is it an autoimmune condition, but it's really damaging the cellular makeup in your body. That's where your energy levels will be impacted, brain function. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Now with um, chemical, oh, that's for a different lab. So let me see if your cholesterol level is normal, but your LDL is high and your HDL is high, then that would be sort of a pre-insulin resistance area. And that's where you would wanna go look at maybe your glucose levels or your A1C to see what those numbers are doing. But again, if your cholesterol panel does not follow that half, half and half ratio, you're dealing likely with an autoimmune condition. So if you see this on your cholesterol, You've also verified it on your CBC with differential. You can be pretty darn sure that you have an autoimmune condition that needs to be regulated. If you address the underlying cause, be it an infection for your autoimmune condition, then your cholesterol levels will tend to balance out, negating the need for a statin. Any questions on that? Do you ever find people that just have to be on statins? Nobody needs to be on statins. Okay. So there's not a genetic thing looming behind. It's always, there's always some kind of infection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one thing to remember, that's a good point that you brought up about genetics is that our genes only control 10 to 20% of what manifests. Our lifestyle, diet, I and mean, when I talk lifestyle, that is diet and stress and inflammation. That's what causes genes to turn off. But when you handle those or remediate them, then those genes can kind of go back off. Okay. So nobody really needs to be on a statin. There's always an underlying cause as far as why those numbers are off. Okay. Okay. And this is the first doctor that I've worked with that's been willing to look for another reason and take me off statin. So I'm just yeah. waiting to see. Yeah, it, I feel like they dispense statins like they're candy. And there are, mm -hmm. like I said, so many negative side effects from statins and your body really needs the cholesterol. We just want it to be in the proper ratio so that it's utilized. Mm -hmm appropriately in the body. Right. Okay. Nobody else has any other questions? Okay. And go back here. Okay. So we're going to talk about the thyroid panel now. Are any of you on thyroid meds? Yes. Okay. Um, had, do you feel a lot better on them or did you initially feel better and then maybe not so much down the road? Um, I didn't notice much. Okay. And you wouldn't be alone. So first of all, I find that a lot of doctors 
only look at one, maybe two markers for determining whether or not you should be on any sort of thyroid medications. But if your thyroid markers are off, usually again, an autoimmune condition is triggering that or not enough cholesterol, okay? So if you don't have cholesterol, your body cannot make the thyroid hormone. It is possible for most people to restore their hormone function naturally. It's not overnight, right? It takes a little while to balance that out, but it is absolutely possible so long as you have not had radiation to your thyroid or had it surgically removed. Okay, so what you wanna look at, um, if you have a thyroid panel in front of you, hopefully your doctor has run a full thyroid panel. And these are the markers for a full thyroid panel. That would be your TSH, T4, T3, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, and then your two um, autoimmune um, markers, which would be your TPO and thy thyroglobulin. Okay. I find frequently that the only marker that most doctors routinely test for is TSH. Do any of you have a full panel? Um, I do, because he's been looking at mine. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. So your TSH, you want between 1.8 and 3.0. And if it is lower than that, we're going to get into that in a second. It indicates that it's maybe a pituitary problem or a hypothalamus issue. Um, and then it can also be, if it's either high or low, it can also be um, Hashimoto's. Okay. And then if it's high, also we're looking at maybe medications that you might be on and or Hashimoto's. T4, we want to see between 6 and 12. And if T4 is low, it's probably an issue with your pituitary again. Um, and same thing if it's low. So that's just telling us that something's off, it's not being made properly. Now T3, I'm not so worried about. It's the free T3 and free T4, which is the usable form for the body. So free T3, we wanna see between three and four. If your free T3 is low, that's probably indicating a problem in your liver. If it's high, it's usually medications. So if you're on medications now for your thyroid, that could be one cause why it's high. Your free T4, we generally want to see between 1.0 and 1.5. And um, your thyroid actually produces the T4. That's what the thyroid produces. So if it's off, then it could be medications or Hashimoto's as well. And then if your um, antibody markers are high or low, then again, that will also indicate Hashimoto's. 95% of the people with a thyroid problem do have Hashimoto's, and usually it is due to a viral infection in the body. So let me explain in a simple, easy way how your body produces a thyroid. So it all starts in the brain. And it uses two neurotransmitters and then it goes to the hypothalamus and then to the pituitary gland. So your pituitary gland makes TSH, okay? And we'll do that right there. So if your TSH numbers are either high or low, the problem is either in the pituitary gland or further up again in the brain, okay? And that's where that cholesterol comes in. So pituitary gland is making the TSH. So if that's off, you're not gonna have the precursor you need to make T4. So when your doctor is just looking at your T4 level and not looking further upstream for what that causes to remediate that problem, it doesn't matter if he puts you on drugs, 
because you're still not making the precursors that you need to make the T4. Does that make sense? And was someone gonna say something? Okay. So from the thyroid, you have your T4. T4 goes to the liver. And in the liver, it is converted to T3. Now, if your T3 numbers are low or high, the problem is in the liver. And so if your liver is overburdened with either toxins, um, fatty liver disease, you know, whatever it may be, you're not going to be able to convert T4 into T3. So if your doctor is supplementing you with T4, but your T3 is low, it doesn't matter. And what happens is then you just get all these extra hormones in your liver that aren't being converted and they continue to disrupt the liver function. So always we need to go back to the brain and kind of look at the TSH and follow that pattern down. We can fix it. You don't need drugs to do it. So we usually do that by supporting the liver and supporting the brain by having enough healthy fats, reducing any adrenal fatigue or stress that you may have, which is a whole nother lab um, that we're not going to look at today. But if we fix the pituitary gland and your transmitters, that's going to improve your TSH, which will help your thyroid. And then if we cleanse your liver out and keep that working well, then the conversion to T3 will be better. If you're struggling with weight gain, weight gain tends to be reverse T3, which is split off here. So again, that tends to be a liver problem. So if you want to start losing weight and balance out the hormones so that you're not becoming obese or bloated like that, then we need to still work on cleansing the liver. Any questions? That's what I was going to ask you what reverse, uh, mine says reverse T3 serum. Yeah. And so that's so the liver T area. Yeah, that is the liver. Exactly. Gut okay. and liver. So, um, you know, if your gut is off, if you have digestive issues, um, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, all of that is the gut and liver area. So if you have any of those, you're not going to be able to convert properly. So I always start. That wasn't my, a problem for, for me. Some, that wasn't okay. Wasn't the problem, but I guess T four. I, I think I I make T four, but but it's not circulated or I. And it's, there still can be other problems with the liver. <clears throat> um, so you know, if you are struggling again with infections, that's going to impact the liver. If you have mold heavy metal toxicity, that all impacts the liver as well. So you may not have digestive issues. Some people are lucky enough that they don't have digestive issues. Well, I've worked it, through a lot, so. Yep. Okay. And so it's, then it's just supporting the body so that it can rebuild what it needs to. Um, so take a look, is your cholesterol panel the way it should be? No. Okay. So that's going to be probably why, you know, that whole stream downwards is affected by the, the cholesterol level. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So again, if your TSH is either high or low, we're looking at a problem where in the brain or the brain. pituitary. pituitary. Okay. And then if you have normal TSH, but low T3, we're looking at a problem in the liver or gut. Okay. All right. So that was, I mean, quick and simple and easy, right? You got all three labs. Um, I welcome anyone that wants me to do a deeper dive into any of their labs. I do offer $100 off if you want me to just for attending the seminar. Um, I think it's really important for you to understand. And I, I look at more labs than just these three, but these are a great place for you to start looking at your labs. Did you uncover anything that, that kind of wakes up your eyes as far as what might be going on with your own health 
If so, there are things that you can do. There's always things that you can do to improve your health and well being. And uh, so, again, I offer $100 off. You can just either email me or um, go to my website. So, today we looked at the CBC with differential, your lipid panel, and your thyroid panel. They're really not that complex. They're all interrelated, but everything goes back to your CBC with differential. So whenever you see a doctor and they do a lab work, always request a CBC with differential. Hopefully they'll do other labs too, but make sure you get a CBC with diff. Okay. Does everyone feel like they have a good enough relationship with your doctor to request labs in particular? Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Okay. And that's it. So what questions do you have? Um, when you're on some of these supplements, um, like you're, you're treating the hormone, like I'm taking pregnenolone mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, um, I'm just wondering how, long before you can actually stop using it? I mean, how long does it take to clean up your body? And um, so for most people in, in the plans that I do, I figure that for every year you've been sick, generally look at about one month of treatment. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you've been sick for 12, 12 years, think 12 months. Um, okay. If you've been sick for 24 years, think two months. Personally, the way I look at healing is I start with whatever the underlying gut problem may be, if it's the infection or toxicity and supporting the iron levels and maybe vitamin D if we need to do that. So I address those first to get rid of that, what's causing inflammation in the body. And then we work on rebuilding the gut. So oftentimes people may have leaky gut, um, or digestive issues, but not everybody does. Then I work on balancing hormones because I can't work on fixing the hormones if the other things are not working properly. Then after we balance hormones, then I do a full detox of the body to get out, um, which I think Barb is what you talked to Karen about a little bit, the cellular level detoxes. Those get out any of the stored toxins in the body so that it can function more efficiently. So everyone is a custom case by looking at their labs for how long it may be and, and specific supplements that we may need to use. But generally we're gonna find, file the same, excuse me, do the same pattern. So we're gonna work on supporting the body first so that the immune system is raised. Then we're gonna work on taking rid of the infections out, then rebuilding the gut hormones and then detox generally is how we work it. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else, Becky or Amy, you guys have any questions? Well, I, I haven't said much <laughs> and, and it's because it, it's a little bit hard for me to talk right now, but um, I, like I said, I've soaked this up. Um, it's been very eye-opening for me. Um, just even being, doing what I do and, and you know, this is, it's kind of basic, but it's so earth shattering, like new info. Yep. Um, and I just really appreciate it. Also, I want to thank you just for being kind <laughs> and, and gentle and tender because that's half the healing for most people. It is. And, and that is like, um, just hearing you as a doctor, and the authority that you have um, and, and being so um, gentle. Is... I, I appreciate that. The way I approach care is that it's a partnership always. It is never me telling someone what they need to do. I need to know what you're willing to do, what your lifestyle is like, what changes you're willing to make. Um, because you have to be compliant. You're ultimately the one who has to do the healing. I can give you all the tools in the world, but if you don't do anything with them, nothing's going to happen. 
but I want you to feel heard because I know I've been in everybody's shoes. I had lupus and fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue and breast implant illness. And I was poo-pooed by doctor after doctor after doctor. And when they told me that I needed to put my affairs in order 10 years ago, I decided, nope. And I took myself off of all medications and I healed myself. Understanding my lab works and having my breast implants removed were the final two steps in my healing journey. I think it's important for you to have someone who's been in your shoes to know what it is to tackle the healing journey because it's not easy. It's not always fun, but it is possible. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend just willy nilly going off meds like I did, but I had had it (laughs) with my doctors and I knew I could take better care of myself. So trust your intuition. You know more about how you're feeling and what's going on with your body than any doctor ever could. So if you feel like something is off, despite what they say, then you fight and advocate for yourself. And, and thank you for that. And one follow-up, you had mentioned mind, body, spirit, I believe. Uh-huh. Can you speak to a little bit of what that looks like? So for me, I include things like breathing and yoga, um, mindset, because it's very easy to, to let our diagnoses become who we are. And yeah. You know, I know with my, my lupus, I'm sure it's stress from a poor marriage and, and two children back to back and, and going back to school for audiology. I was getting my doctorate in audiology. Then it was, it was a lot on my, my plate. And the only way I had me time was to be like, oh, I don't feel good. Right. That was my, that was my thing. That was the only time my ex-husband stepped up to help me. Mm. And so I started letting my lupus diagnosis become me, right? So there is always, when you look at mindset, any illness that we have, you'll see people that really take the victim role. And I hate to put it that way, but they become it. They become absorbed by it. It's their life, right? They can't go anywhere. They can't do anything. When you (laughs) flip that and you start looking at things positively about what your potential is, then suddenly that's when healing starts to take place. If someone's stuck in this woe is me mindset, it doesn't matter how well they feel or what medications they're on. They're never going to actually heal. Right. This is why things like meditation and mindset are able to, um, have spontaneous remissions on cancers and things like that, because something flips in the brain and you go, I'm done with this. I'm done. What can you learn from what you're sick with? So for me, I learned that I was in a bad marriage, you know, that I was stressed and I needed to learn self care instead of pleasing everybody all the time. It's not easy, like I said, right? But when you start to look back and you go, wow, okay, this is what I was doing to myself that just furthered what was going on, you'll make those changes. So you have to understand what's the driving factor for you. What do you get out of it? Um, and it's, some, it's subconscious. Nobody says, I want to be sick, right? Nobody ever says that. But what is your subconscious doing? What are you not what in your life is not supporting you the way it needs to be supported so that you can heal. And, th- and that's where I really integrate the, the mind part. So yoga, I do yoga, um, energy medicine. I do all sorts of things with that, but I like the labs because it's analytical. It's concrete. You can say, this is what's wrong. And you know, okay, these are the changes I need to make. And then in the same token, we work on all the other parts too. So it's a, really a full body approach to healing. Got it. That was a long winded answer. <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you. Uh-huh. Barb, any other questions? I don't think I have any right now, but I really uh, appreciated listening to you and, and um, hearing all the good stuff you had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I will, um, again, if anyone wants to write it down, my website address is www.elementsofhealing.com. 
of wellness, the number one.com. And on there, I have a cheat sheet for reading your blood work. So you're able to go to the website and scroll down and do that. Or if you want to schedule even a free consult with me, you can do that on the website too. Is that after wellness, the number one and then the number one, correct. And Dr. Alexi, right? Yep. Is that your last name or your first name? First name. My last name is Silence. <clears throat> what kind of doctor are you, Dr. Alexi? So I am an audiologist. I'm also a doctor of natural health. Okay. So on my own healing journey, I decided to go back to school. <laughs> and so here I am. So I do both. <laughs> That's great. And do you have Zoom meetings across the U.S. for patients? I do. I do. So I do a lot um, virtually. Um, I also have, I'm finishing up doing an academy online. So there's courses if people just want to sign up online and do courses. You can mm -hmm. do that as well. Um, and I teach breathing techniques. So I have a whole sorts mm -hmm. of arsenal of, of things. So, you know, if you have any questions, I always recommend just set up a free consult with me and let me answer what I can for you and help you out however I can. All right. I appreciate that. Thank my you very pleasure. much. My pleasure. Thank you. You guys have a great evening. And again, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, okay? All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye-bye.